اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد و الثناء للہ رب العالمین بارئ الخلائق اجمعین باعث الانبیاء والمرسلین ثم الصلاة والسلام على سیدنا و نبینا و حبیب قلوبنا و طبیب نفوسنا و شفیع ذنوبنا ابی القاسم المصطفی محمد و علی اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین المکرمین المنتجبین لا سیما بقیت اللہ فی الارضین روحی و ارواح العالمین لتراب مقدمه الفداء و لعنت اللہ علی اعدائهم اجمعین الى قیام یوم الدین For the hastening and the return of our imam, please recite the salawat. One of the things that needs to be abstained from in fast, obviously, is food and drink. What is the definition of food and drink? What the scholars have defined initially, a general maybe definition we can give, of what is intended by food and drink is anything that enters and can be swallowed through the mouth okay. it doesn't obviously technically have to be something that's considered food there are certain things we don't eat normally but if it goes down one's throat or if one swallows it then that's going to be something that will break the fast any liquid any solid that goes down the throat that is going to be something that we're going to have to avoid. Whether it's medication, it is food, it is drink, it is none of the above. If somebody would like to, I wouldn't encourage this, but swallow a small pebble, uh, that's not something that uh, would be considered food or drink or medication or anything, but still it will invalidate the fast. <clears throat> now that's pretty obvious, I think we all uh, sort of know that, but a couple of things related to that. One is, what's the point uh, which after that, if, it, if we have it, it's going to break the fast? For example, if I, put, if I put food in my mouth, does that invalidate the fast? If I put water in my mouth, does that invalidate the fast? If I gargle, does that invalidate the fast? The answer is that the throat is the border. Once it goes down the throat, as soon as it gets there, the fast will be invalid. Before that, it's fine. So if you gargle, if you put mouthwash in your mouth, for example, and you gargle with that, if you're careful that nothing goes down, nothing gets to your throat, even if it's a small amount, then that's not going to create a problem for the fast. That's one thing. That needs to be made clear. <clears throat> if it's something that enters, a brother was just uh, tonight asking, uh, it's something that's supposed to numb the throat. So how do they do it? They, they need to spray the back of your throat. Well, that part of the throat is something that if, it, if a liquid, a fluid, a solid hits it, then that's it. The, the fast is going to be invalid. We can't allow that either. Although it doesn't go down, the boundary is that if it enters it, then it's going to be problematic. That's one thing. The other thing is about uh, medication. Now, obviously, medication that we take, we need to swallow. It's a pill. It's a syrup of some form. That's something we definitely need to avoid. There's no question about it. If somebody takes that, their fast will be invalid. This doesn't mean that it's haram to have that. If one needs to take that medication, it's a requirement for their health. They're allowed to have it, but they need to make up their fast later on. If it's an illness that's going to be cured by next month of Ramadan, they're going to have to make it up. Otherwise, there are certain rules that apply. So, it will invalidate the fast if we have a medication that we're going to be swallowing. 
One thing about that is that we have to make sure that the illness, the health situation that we have, that causes us to take that medication has to be a serious one. In other words, there's plenty of times that doctors give you pills to take. They're not necessarily something that you have to take. You can avoid them. We will, are not permitted, we're not allowed to take that during uh, our fast. But if it is something that is really needed and necessary, then we are allowed to take it. We just have to make that fast up later on. But what about injections? That's not something that you swallow. Is that problematic or is it not? On this, there are some differences of opinion. Some like Ayatla Khamenei say, injections that are purely medication, they're not in any form uh, food-like. They don't provide any form of nutrition. They're simply medication that is supposed to deal with an illness. And there is, as I said, no nutrition, a nutritional value to it. Um, that's something that can be taken. For example, if you take an injection in your mouth to, um, to numb your, your gums, that's going to be something that's okay according to him. But if it, is that has, if it is something that has nutritional value, he says, you can't have that unless it's a must. If you do have it, then you're going to have to repeat that fast later on. Some of the other maraja have uh, different opinions on that. Recite a salawat, please. <coughs> We hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala up to this point in the month of Ramadan has forgiven us and if He has not forgiven us and released us from the hellfire that through our own actions we are deserving as we have in hadith we hope and pray that from this point onwards or at, on this night by the right of the Ahlul Bayt especially Imam al Hussein that will be Discussing and talking about and remembering that he forgives us, inshallah. Recite a salawat. So, we've been trying to learn from, benefit from the lives of the Ahlul Bayt, and each night we are addressing and speaking of one of the Ahlul Bayt. We've spoken of the Holy Prophet, Amirul Mu'mineen. The Lady Fatima al Zahra, Imam al Hassan, Salamullah alayhim, and tonight we want to speak of Imam al Hussein, Salamullah alayhim. <laughs> we should have been hearing a lot about Imam al Hussein in the month of Muharram. And we should know much about him, much about his movement, much about what he has done in his life, his accomplishments. Thank you. Okay, let's recite a loud salawat that will organize the session, inshallah. Malana Shabiri left after iftar and he had the skill of being able to organize everything and make sure it starts right. Now, tonight he isn't here and there seems to be a bit of chaos. Recite another salawat, please. <coughs> We should have studied, learned, heard much about the movement of Imam al Hussein. But this individual, this Imam, with what he has done, with the movement, the revolution he led, is without exaggeration something that requires constant study, continuous study. The more you look at it, the more you learn. I have read this story a number of times. I have spoken about it myself a number of times. Almost every Muharram, there is some mention of it. Thank you. Is that another salawat? Oh. 
But yet, when I study the story again, when I look at the life of Imam al Hussein again, there's still a lot more to learn and discover. And there's more depth to understand of the movement of Sayyidu Shuhada. Imam al Hussein of the Ahlul Bayt is very special. This is why we have very special statements about him. That he is Safinatul Nijat and Misbahul Huda. The lantern of guidance. The lantern of guidance. There's reasons for that. We want to try to briefly go over what Imam al Hussein was able to accomplish, what his movement was all about outside of the month of Ramadan, hopefully being able to address it in, in one night in a way where we hopefully see it from a different perspective. We learn more about it and I honestly uh, ask and request brothers and sisters to pay attention to details. Okay. Please pay attention to details and try to think about what's being said. Believe me, I really don't have any business here entertaining anybody here. Okay, I'm not, I'm not an entertainer. This is information that I feel is very beneficial, very important for every one of us to learn and to think how that's going to manifest and be implemented in our own lives. I really believe this. Everything about the Ahlul Bayt is something to learn about and to see how it applies to me. This concept of coming and hearing and saying Alhamdulillah that was a nice talk and getting up and leaving and business as usual. This is not the way our lives should be. The Ahlul Bayt have taught us through the way they lived their lives. The way they did things and we got to learn from that. What did Imam al Hussein do? We want to talk about the life of Imam. Let me give you a bit of, again, some very simple facts of history. The year of the birth of Imam al Hussein is the fourth year after the Hijrah. A year after Imam Hassan al Mushtaba, actually less than a year. Why? Because Imam Hassan was born in what month? The month of Ramadan. Midway through that month, and Imam al Hussein is born in the beginning of Sha'ban of the following year, so it's less than a year. And the year of his Shahada is the year 61 after the Hijrah. We all know it's Ashura, 10th of Muharram. The year 61 after the Hijrah of the Holy Prophet. The Imam of the Imam begins after the Shahada of Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba, Salamullah alayhi. which we mentioned is the year 49 after the Hijrah. So from the year 49 to 61 is the Imamah of Imam al Hussein. He lived a total of how many years? If we do the math, that'll be about 66 years. And that's something to make note of. That on the battlefield, all the stories you've heard, all the stories we've heard of the chivalry of Imam al Hussein on the plains of Karbala on the day of Ashura is from a 66 year old man 66 year old man is able to do to the enemies what you've heard over and over every year in the month of Muharram what did Imam al Hussein do? what was the Imam of the Imam all about? part of it I've already touched I've already explained. When we were talking about the movement of Imam Hassan al Mujtaba, we talked about that last point the strength that the Imam had after what happened, and he accepted with bravery and with strength the truce with Muawiyah. And the strength he had manifested in many ways. One of them was that the Imam led a movement, an underground movement that was supposed to develop and become the government of the Ahlul Bayt according to hadith 
on the year 70, 10 years after what happened in Karbala. They had planned that out. So Imam al-Mujtaba did that part. 10 years of the Imam of Imam al Hussein was continuing with that. Have you ever wondered what, because the only thing we hear of Imam al Hussein is what? The story of Karbala. That was only for a few months. From Rajab, Sha'ban, Ramadan, Shawwal, the Qa'da, the Hajjah, Muharram. What about the 10 years before that? What happened? What was the Imam doing? There are many important stances that the Imam has taken. One of the things, for example, that he's done is that this Pledge of Allegiance for Yazid was something that Muawiyah was taking from people after the Shahada of Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba. He started taking allegiance from people that after Muawiyah, it'll be Yazid. Imam al Hussein had a role to play. He didn't pledge that allegiance at the time of Muawiyah. Muawiyah pressured the Imam in different ways. Tried to silence the Imam. The Imam was doing his thing. He had to take those stances. He had his movement that he was leading. He was working with the people. Sometimes you hear about Kufa and you think that from the time of Amir al Mu'mineen and the six months of Imam al Mujtaba until Karbala, 20 years, Imam al Hussein was cut off from the Shia in Kufa. It's not the case. Imam Hassan, after him, Imam al Hussein, they had connections, they were building more and more real companions. <coughs> This is what the Imam was doing during that time. However, we see that, as we mentioned, that movement, according to the Hadith, was supposed to be one that was going to bear its fruits in the year 70 after the Hijrah. What happens that Imam al Hussein, in the year 61, or actually 60, because that's when he starts his movement, decides to start this movement it's a bit premature it seems according to their own predictions they're telling us that this movement will build up in the year 70 it'll bear its fruits it's premature in the year 60 it's 10 years premature what happens why does imam al hussein start the movement what's the objective why does he make this decision. Another question to ask, if it's about getting killed in the way of Allah, fighting for the cause of Allah, why didn't Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba do the same thing? Why did Imam al Hussein do this? We sort of address this, but there's one other point that needs to be mentioned if we get time. But it's something to think about, even if we don't get time to, to cover it on this one night that we're discussing Imam al Hussein. It's a very important question. Why did Imam al Hussein do this? Why didn't Imam Hassan al Mujtaba do this? Why didn't Imam al Sajjad do this? Didn't Imam al Sajjad live at the time of Yazid? Why didn't Imam al baqir do this? Why didn't the rest of the Imams do this? Why didn't Imam al Hussein have to do this? What was he trying to accomplish with this movement? These are serious questions we got to constantly ask ourselves. There are different statements that have come from Imam al Hussein about the reason why he did this. For example, you've all heard that the Imam has said, I'm doing this as what? As Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi al Munkar. You've heard this, right? You've heard he's doing this for Al Islah fi Ummat Jaddi. To bring reform to the Ummah, not to the religion, to the nation of my Prophet. <coughs> you have that statement. You have other things as well. 
we have to put everything into perspective, put all the pieces of evidence together, and come up with a comprehensive answer. <clears throat> and not look at Karbala as something very simple that happened in history, that Imam al Hussein felt in order to save the religion of his grandfather, he just decided to go towards Kufa, and he decided to not pledge allegiance, he was upset at them or something, and he went there, we read, we cry, Imam al Hussein in Medina said, I'm going, and death is following us on the way, he said, in Medina, he said, we are going for death, I've seen the Holy Prophet telling me that, we cry about it, and so the purpose of Imam al Hussein is to go out there and become shaheed to save the Ummah of the Holy Prophet. In what way? What does that exactly mean? It's not clear. Sometimes, some interpretations of that honestly remind one of Christ, the way the Christians put it. We just feel that he went and got killed to save our religion by us crying for him or for, in that way when we cry for him our sins are forgiven something similar it's not the same but similar <clears throat> what was it that needed imam al hussein's blood and did it need imam al hussein's blood was the imam really from the beginning some have said this was the imam from the beginning intending to go there to become shaheed is that the purpose? Or was there a different purpose? He was trying to do something else. <clears throat> These are serious questions that we have to ask. If he wanted to become Shaheed, and that was the purpose, then why all the talks in Mecca? You know from Medina in Rajab, when they brought the news that the Mal'un Muawiyah has entered Hellfire, Imam al Hussein left Medina. Where did he go? To Mecca. The remainder of Rajab, Sha'ban, Ramadan, Shawwal, the Qa'da, the Hajjah. On the 9th of the Hajjah, he leaves. What talks does he give in Mecca? Why is it that people from Kufa write letters to the Imam and they ask him to come and lead them and govern them? And based on that, the Imam sends someone to go and weigh the situation and tell the Imam if the people, there are enough people to tell the Imam to come. If he's just going to get killed, then it doesn't matter if there are any people in Kufa, there, in, there aren't any people in Kufa. Why even go towards Kufa? Why not go towards Basra? Why not go towards Sham? Go towards Yemen? Why towards Kufa? The reason why I'm raising these questions is to cause us to think. This is a problem that many times we have. We don't think about things. We just hear about things and we just maybe read about them, but we don't think about them. What's more important is to think. Is what this Shaykh coming and telling us even making sense at all or not? <clears throat> What seems to be the movement of the Imam according to the analysis that some of the ulama <coughs> have given us which seems to have much evidence to back it up and to prove that this is the case it shows why the Imam made this move I want to try to make this very short on this night <coughs> and hopefully draw the conclusions that are important for us on this day for today there are practical conclusions lessons that we can learn from this when you look at the movement of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi
As we mentioned on that first night that we spoke about the Holy Prophet, he really changed that society upside down over the course of 23 years. And he brought that society and that community, <clears throat> those people and that nation of the Holy Prophet on the right tracks that if the believers would have continued to move on those tracks that the Holy Prophet had put down for them, which is Siratul Mustaqim, they would have progressed towards prosperity and have, would have gotten more and more of that as they moved in this world and the hereafter. <clears throat> From all dimensions. Look, the Islamic government that was a necessary an extremely important part of the Islamic teachings <clears throat> that according to the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt, there's a number of them out of the five pillars of not faith but practice that includes Hajj, it includes fasting, it includes Salat, it includes Zakat the last one which is referred to as Wilaya which is government is considered to be the most important the Imam is asked why, he says, because the last and the wilaya is the key to the rest. The government, the Islamic government is the key to the implementation of Islamic laws in society. And for society to progress towards perfection, towards prosperity, in this world and in the hereafter. An Islamic government just doesn't get the prayers done, doesn't make sure people pray and be backwards and not have education, not have technology and so on and so forth. No. Actually when you look at the government that was created by the Holy Prophet with all the deficiencies that were caused by the people after the Holy Prophet the government at the time of the Abbasids, you can see how far away from true Islam they've moved. The government of the Abbasids became top in, if we can call that technology at that time, in the sciences and the different disciplines, in medicine, in mathematics and so on. The Muslims, that Muslim empire was moving in all these different areas. They were the top. <coughs> Prosperity in this life and in the hereafter. It's one package. The Holy Prophet brought these people on those tracks. They started somewhere and they were supposed to move forward. But after the Holy Prophet, gradually this started going off track. All right, This started going off track. By the time of Imam al Hussein, since we're trying to cut this short and make this very <coughs> brief, two things came together that posed a threat to the very foundations of Islam and the nation of Islam in Muslims. If they wouldn't be wouldn't have been addressed by the Imam in an effective way, what would have happened would have been that we really wouldn't have had Islam, the direction that things had taken, without any exaggeration. Because I remember hearing this when I was a kid. Right? Islam wouldn't have been there. But it doesn't really click, we don't really understand the magnitude of that. And that's why we don't appreciate as much. We don't appreciate what the Ahlul Bayt have done, the sacrifice they went through. What are these two? There was an external enemy to the Holy Prophet. There was an enemy that was outside the community of believers. The enemy was Shirk, the Kuffar, spearheaded by two groups. The Mushrikeen and the Yahud, the Jews. Okay. These were according to the Holy Quran. These two. The Holy Prophet had that external enemy. What did the Holy Prophet do to them? 
Some Jews accepted Islam, others were kind of kicked out of the Muslim Empire at the time of the Holy Prophet. They had to leave. With regards to the Mushrikeen in Mecca, the Holy Prophet eventually came without even shedding blood and without fighting, he took over Mecca. All right? The Mushrikeen, what they had to do is with all disgrace, they had to come and accept the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Abu Sufyan realized that this is it. There's no way we can resist this anymore. They're too strong. His evil intelligence and genius told him that the only way we can survive is to accept Islam. But Abu Sufyan never truly accepted Islam. Right? That enemy of the Holy Prophet became to be part of the Muslim Ummah, but he never changed his identity. But they were not really seen, they weren't top, they weren't effective members of society, they were under control. The Holy Prophet put them under control. For example, I'll just give you one example. When the Holy Prophet was ill and there were signs that he was going to be passing away, the Holy Prophet, you know, he did all he could to make sure the Khilafah of Amir al muminin actually takes place after the Holy Prophet. He took many steps. Jaysh al-Usama, you maybe you've heard of that, the army of Usama was one tactic to get everybody out of Medina. There was another thing also that happened. Abu Sufyan was sent to far away places to collect zakat. That sounded like something pretty good for him, okay? You collect zakat, you get to keep a bit of it as well. He loved his money and wealth. He liked to be somebody, the Holy Prophet sent him, I'll collect the zakat and come back. He came after the Saqifah was done, and the first Khalifa, they had pledged allegiance to him. He came, he still had, he still wanted to create some mischief there, that Amir al muminin prevented. But the Holy Prophet had him under control, this was only one example. During the time of the first two Khalifa, to an extent, he was under control. But gradually, they started to find their way into the Islamic government. Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan, the older brother of Muawiyah apparently, he was the first governor of Sham after they took it over during the time of the second Khalifa. They started giving, getting positions. He got a position, then Muawiyah got positions. Other people from Bani Umayyah started getting positions in government. Uthman became the third Khalifa. He's from Bani Umayyah. At that time, it was the peak of it. They started receiving a lot of wealth for no good reason. Positions, the governor of Kufa, the governor of Basra, the governor of Egypt. Obviously, Sham. These were all from Bani Umayyah. This enemy of the Holy Prophet started gaining power more and more until you see during the time of Uthman, Muawiyah becomes very strong. He's got very strong roots in Sham. And when Amir al muminin becomes Khalifa, he's not willing to give up. And he has, well, from worldly perspective, he's developed enough control over the region that he's able to tell Amir al muminin no, I'm not going to give it up. I'm not gonna listen. And he fights Amir al muminin And eventually, as you heard, and we discussed that last night as well, it came to a point where Imam Hassan al Mujtaba had to accept the truce. And Muawiyah became the ruler over the entire Muslim empire. This enemy grew and became that strong. This is one enemy of Islam. There is another enemy. That's a more dangerous one, brothers and sisters. A much more dangerous one. It's something, I hope none of us, I don't see any Abu Sufyans here. Okay. I don't see any Muawiyahs here. I don't see any Yazids here. Okay. But the second enemy is a very serious enemy. What is it? <clears throat> the believers 
that at the time of the Holy Prophet, when he came to Medina, he said, people, for the sake of Allah, choose brothers and split your wealth. Have you ever thought of that? Are you, are you willing to share your wealth, split it with your brother? Somebody, just pick somebody in the room. You don't even know. Just because they're your brother in faith. Are you willing to split your wealth with them? Honestly. See how much devotion it takes? When the Holy Prophet told the believers he called for jihad, some people came crying to the Holy Prophet, find me a horse or something, I want to join you in battle, I want to put my life on the line. And I don't have a horse to come and join you. They would cry, the Quran tells us this, this is not even hadith, the Quran tells us this. People would come and ask the Holy Prophet, can you pray for my shahada? What was important for them? Remember the first night, I don't know how many of you were here. Talk about real Iman. What drives you? What was driving people during the time of the Holy Prophet was God, was Akhirah, the hereafter, the proximity of the divine. <coughs> Night prayers, not taking the dunya seriously, easily giving it up, easily sharing. The dunya wasn't something that was very important to these people. When they got the war booty, God told them, no, before you used to just split it amongst yourselves, this time you're not doing that. Keep it for now, the Holy Prophet is going to tell you how much each, each person gets. First one-fifth of it is going to be khums, the rest of it you get to distribute, of the land you get nothing. Believers would sometimes overdo it. You have women in Medina coming to the Holy Prophet and telling him, O oh, Prophet of God, tell my husband something. He says, what's going on? She says, my husband is fasting during the day. At night he's worshipping. He's never home. He's not taking care of us. The Holy Prophet gets upset. He goes to the masjid and tells people, look, don't overdo it. I spend time with my family. I eat food. You should be doing that as well. Don't overdo it. They were so detached from the dunya, from the glamour of this dunya, it, they didn't care about this stuff. The majority of believers were like this. What do they care about? Worship. What do they care about? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them. If the Holy Prophet is pleased with them. That was important to them. They would do anything for that. If their responsibility was something that they had to do, even if it meant that they're going to lose their life, they didn't have a problem with it. That's why they went to the battlefields. They fought. One after the other. You know how many battles the Holy Prophet fought? We only hear three, four different names. There's a very long list. I think if I remember correctly, it's in the hundreds. It's in the hundreds. People would still go with the Holy Prophet. The driving force of the people was Al-Akhirah, the hereafter. What about this dunya? Not very important to them. If that is something that drives a person, especially the leaders of a community, then you have the guidance of what is right and what is wrong. This community, this society is going to move in the right direction. All right. But what happened, brothers and sisters, was that gradually, after the demise of the Holy Prophet, in the year 10 after the Hijrah. Until 
the year 60 after the Hijrah. Even before that, why do I want to go that far? The year 35 after the Hijrah, when Amir al Mu'mineen, Salamullah alayhi, became the Khalifa, the issue he had is the same companions that put their lives on the line, that gave everything they had for the Holy Prophet, were not worried about cash, worried about gold, worried about this dunya, worried about what their share is. There was a race, how much each person has. I read a figure that blew me away. Mus'ab ibn Zubair, the son of Zubair, Zubair was a good companion of the Holy Prophet. He even stood up for Amirul Mu'mineen after the demise of the Holy Prophet. But at the time of Uthman, the dowry Mus'ab ibn Zubair puts for his wife in their marriage is a million gold coins. One million gold coins. just for the dowry of his wife. God knows how much they had. They have a race. How much is each person going to have? They see, oh, this person has this much. Oh, why don't I have this? I need to go and figure out how I can have that much. Oh, this person got this position. Let me see if I can get it as well. The race is no longer to please God. What drives people is no longer God. What is it that drives them? The dunya. Their mind is busy now with the dunya. The glamour of the dunya. How much gold do you have? Do you rule over, are you a governor of a region or are you not? Who is this happening to? This is happening to the conscious members, the religious members, those who are supposed to have leadership positions leading the other believers in the right direction. What do I mean by that? In every community, brothers and sisters, you have two groups of people. Right here we have two groups of people. Right? I hope we're of the second group. What are they? One group of people are the ones that just don't think When they want to make stances, they just don't think. They come in the center, everyone's chanting, Allahu Akbar, Khomeini Rahbar, they chant, Allahu Akbar, Khomeini Rahbar. Okay. Next day they come, people say, no, 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 you don't talk about Imam Khomeini here? Like, okay, no, 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 you don't talk about Imam Khomeini here. One day it's this, one day is that. They don't really think. Whatever direction everybody goes, they just go with them. Ignorance. Lack of analysis of what's going on, what the circumstances are. Is this the right thing to do? Is it the wrong thing to do? They just lack that. There are always people like that in every community, every society. Right? But then there are people that know what they're doing. They realize what the circumstances are. They realize what the consequences of their actions are. They realize if this is the time that for religious purposes I need to stand and speak, or it's a time that I need to remain silent. They may not have a perfect understanding of that, but they at least think before making decisions, before taking sides, before taking stances. And they really think, like, let, me, let me say a couple more words with regards to this. In this day and age, the problem we have, you know what it is? The delusion that I understand. Thinking that I know what I'm talking about. We're influenced by the media, the, in, the media is able to push people one way or the other, and we are on top of it, we know exactly what all the different news agencies are telling us. Of course, 
All of the news agencies means what? Means CNN, Fox, BBC. We read all of that. We have all that information. We may take a look at some of the other stuff as well, but what sticks in our minds is that. And we think we're comfortable with the decisions we're making. I know what's going on. I know what's right and what's wrong. If there's a discussion, passionately I will defend my stance. I'll throw out all the facts. Where did I get them? CNN, Fox News. Okay. Why do you think the people that want to control the world are also in, co in control of media? Because they realize people are becoming or seeming to become a bit more intelligent. They need to have more intelligent ways to control masses. They need to make them feel like they know what right and wrong is. And they, thinking that they're doing the right thing, will do and go, go and do exactly what they want them to do. This is still the same ignorance that existed at that time. You have these, these types of people. I hope to God I'm not one of them. I hope to God I'm not one of these types of people. Then you have the other type of people that know. They look into things, they analyze, they realize, oh, if you just follow CNN, you realize how many lies they tell you. All you got to do is just continuously check it and think, remember, hey, wait a second, this is contradicting something they said the other day. That's all you got to do. But we just read it, get on with work, not really pay attention to it. You got to think, analyze. Americans that are not even Muslim, that are part of Qawmu Fir'aun, I like to call them. They're looking at this and like, wait a second, there's something wrong here. There's too many lies here. But some of the believers don't have this. So, you have these two groups of people. Now the people who understand what's right and what's wrong, right? if they understand what's right and what's wrong, if their motives are divine, if they don't care about the dunya, you can feel comfortable that this community is going to move in the right direction. Even if you have the worst enemy around you. Why? Because you have people that are guarding the community. Conscious individuals that know what's going on. For the sake of Allah, they are standing where they need to stand, taking stances, helping the community move in the right direction. And nobody can buy them off, because they're not about the dunya. Nobody can threaten them, because they're waiting for the moment they give their life for the sake of Allah. Now, what happened at the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen and from there on at the time of Imam al-Hasan, Imam al-Husayn, sallallahu alayhi wa ajma'in, was that these believers gradually started getting poisoned by the dunya. They started getting poisoned by the dunya. Now they realize, yes, this is the right thing to do. I understand that, but my motives have changed. I don't want to do the right thing anymore. I want to do what's going to bring more money in my pocket. I want to do what is going to give me ray. Isn't that what Umar ibn Sa'd said? He realized what he was doing. He knew this means hellfire, but hellfire isn't important for him any longer. What's important? What he never got, of course. He wanted to become the governor of Ray, a very wealthy part of the Muslim empire at that time. People, many people, didn't take stances out of fear. Imam al Hussein is observing this. He's seeing that. The people in this Muslim community, the Muslim society, the Muslim empire, the Islamic ummah, 
the nation of Islam, these people that are supposed to be in good numbers, motivated by divine incentives, have now their taste buds have changed. It's the dunya that's more important. That on one hand, the first enemy that we were talking about, which hates Islam and wants to destroy it in whatever way they can, these two coming together, you have the external enemy and you have the internal disease, that means complete destruction and annihilation. That would have happened. When the enemy of Islam starts having power, authority in society, brothers and sisters, it is going to use that authority against Islam. Sometimes I feel we don't get this. We think that, oh, if you know, we, we're uh, fed this misunderstanding and misinformation on secularism, and we think that there's truth to it. Okay, secularism meaning you separate religion and politics. Look, nobody has ever separated religion and politics. What that means, you know what that means? That means you religious people hush up, don't talk about politics. The politicians, they can do whatever they want to religion, but you guys just hush up and don't say anything about religion, uh, about politics, that's what that means. Politicians will go and change religion to whatever way they want. This is what Muawiyah did, the power that government gave him. He fabricated hadith. He paid hundreds of thousands of dinar to these companions of the Holy Prophet to fabricate hadith and say some of the verses of the Holy Quran that talk about corrupt people have been revealed in the context of Amir al Mu'mini, referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib. On the other hand, some of the verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in the Holy Quran, he had them fabricate that this good person that is being spoken of here is Muawiyah or Uthman. He's using that as a political tactic. He wants that the people accept him and not go against him. He wants to use religion for that. And he doesn't want, to, he doesn't want people to admire Amir al-Mu'mineen and to gather behind Imam al-Mujtaba and Imam al Hussein, because of the passionate feelings they may have towards Amir al-Mu'mineen from a religious perspective. He sees that religiously these people are attached. In order to get rid of that, he's going to fabricate this. Over and over and over. All the la'an that you hear, you think it's just grudges against Amir al-Mu'mineen? It was done. Amir al-Mu'mineen got killed in the mind of Muawiyah. Why did he have to curse Amir al-Mu'mineen? on the manaba for a century, if not more. Political motives, political reasons. Imam al Hussein realized that this needs to happen. At the time of Imam al Hassan, and even in the, in the 10 years of Imam al Hussein, before Yazid taking a stance against that wouldn't be possible because as we mentioned last night with regards to Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba Salamullah alayhi Muawiyah was very clever he would do it in a way that it would seem like the companions of Imam al-Mushtaba killed him not Muawiyah as he did with Imam al-Mushtaba didn't he? who actually was behind the death of Imam al-Mushtaba it was Muawiyah but how did he do it? he got the wife of Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba to do it If Imam al Hussein would have tried to do what he did in Karbala before the death of Muawiyah, a similar thing would have happened. Imam al Hussein didn't take a stance at that time. When Yazid came to power, the circumstances were right. The Imam could make a move to shake the foundations of this nation and all the believers in it to realize that there's something wrong. What is happening to us? Sometimes, when you have a patient that doesn't have a heartbeat, you need to give them a shock. All right? You need to give them a shock to revive them. 
That's what Imam Al-Hussein was trying to do. He spoke to people in Mecca over the course of those months that he was there. In the congregation of Hajj, look, in the months leading to the Hajjah that people would come for Hajj, people start gradually in Shawwal and the Qada, they start gradually gathering in Mecca. So there's loads of people. Imam Al Hussein gives talk after talk after talk about what's going on. So this is why he took the stance. He wanted to save the Ummah. But what did he exactly do? What he did, very briefly again, I will try to address this. Imam Al Hussein wanted to create this shock and to bring the Ummah back on track. He had to make some commotion. He had to make a move. That's why he used Mecca. People gathered from all over the Islamic Empire. From all over. Everybody had come. Imam Al Hussein was very strategic in picking Mecca. Don't think he just decided to go to Mecca for he liked to do Umrah or for some odd reason. No, there's a reason. He didn't go into the deserts. He didn't go hiding. He went to Mecca. Why? He wants to talk to people. He wants to leave an impression. Right? He has to create this commotion. He moves towards Kufa from there. So that in order to make this change, this reform, if he creates this commotion, two things can happen. One, remember we said that Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein were working on people and individuals, building them as true believers. If those people would have caught on and done what they were supposed to have done, this commotion would have caused an uprising led by the Imam that could have actually started a movement against Yazid and he would have been able to get rid of Yazid take over, create and establish the Islamic government of the Holy Prophet that he was supposed to, he was the Imam that could have happened that's why he took stances he encouraged people to stand up he encouraged people to rise He talked to people about sending Muslim ibn Aqil, his own cousin, to Kufa. He sent him over there to see if people are willing to pledge allegiance. What is that bay'ah for? He wants to set up government. If those people would have done what they needed to, what they should have, that would have turned into a serious uprising. That would have gradually led to the Islamic government of the Ahlul Bayt. If that would have happened, Alhamdulillah. But because that wasn't the only objective, or that wasn't the main objective, there was another possibility. What is that? That that doesn't happen. What happens? The Imam gets killed. If they don't do what they need to do, what's going to happen is that the Imam is going to get killed. But the effect of him getting killed in that way, after that commotion, is going to be that shock that the Ummah needed. And that's why Imam Al-Hussein said, if to save the nation of my grandfather, I need to get killed, then let the swords come. He realized that. One of two things is going to happen. Either one is okay. The important thing is to shake the nation of the Holy Prophet Bring it back on track. And he seriously shook that nation up. You know how many uprisings happened after that? And we don't have time, we've already gone over the time that we have, to talk about the impact that it actually had. That requires thought, study. What the Imam was able to do with this. We just hear Karbala, maximum something about Sham and in a way where we shed tears which we do need to do that but that's pretty much it we don't realize what Zainab Salamullah Alayha did what Imam Al Sajjad did oh, 
to continue this movement and create that shock. A number of uprisings, some of you I think, because uh, I didn't watch that, the, the series of Mukhtar Nama, but a lot of people seem to have watched it. Now that, don't get your history from that movie, okay? <laughs> That's not accurate on history, I'm not saying that it's a bunch of lies, no. But the producer and the producers themselves, uh, you know, we're not trying to show exactly the details of history and what happened. That's not the point. So don't think that that's exactly how things happen. But you get an idea. You get an idea of the number of uprisings that happened. These people that were not willing to put their lives on the line. You've heard the stories in Karbala. They weren't willing to put their lives on the line. Now group after group, they started putting their lives on the line. They realized, no, we can't do this. In Medina, in Kufa, elsewhere, these different movements started to happen. Life started coming back to the nation of the Holy Prophet. We hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the ability to understand this and to become one of those that the Imams wanted us. Don't forget, those who make decisions, they understand circumstances, they're not just pushed around with media and with others. No, they think and they understand what they're doing. And hopefully what drives them is Iman, is God, is Al-Akhirah, not the glamour of the dunya, not cars and homes and the digits of your bank account and so on and so forth, inshallah. Assalamu alaykum Ya Ahla Bayt al-Nubuwa Wa mawdi'a ومختلف الملائكة ومهبط الواحي ومعدن الرحمن وخزان العين May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. My beloved Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. It was in your homes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with guidance and revelation. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. Angels descend upon you day in and day out, seeking permission before entering upon you. Sallallahu alayka ya Abba Abdullah Sallallahu alayk Ya Mazlum Ayyuha al-Shaheed Bikarbala May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you 
my beloved Imam al Hussein, my beloved oppressed Imam, the Imam that was slaughtered by the shores of the Euphrates while his mouth was dry of a thirst Sallallahu Let's take our hearts to the plains of Karbala The day of Ashura Sallallahu alayka ya madlub I was thinking what part of the masaib, the difficulties, the cruelties, the sorrows of Karbala I should talk about We're in the month of Ramadan The one that comes to mind is about the Atash, the thirst of the Imam and his family Ruhi laka al Imagine the Imam, his companions, his family Dogs and pigs were allowed water but your beloved Imam was not given water It's already difficult brothers and sisters try to picture The men they have to fight in the heat of Karbala it really takes up a lot of energy and strength If you don't have water in you You get tired very quickly From the morning they've had no water The companions go one by one To the battlefield They go and fight in the heat of Karbala with the armor they were wearing, with the number of enemies they had before them. No wonder Ali and Al Akbar called, O Ya Abata, Al Atashu Qad Qatalani. O Father, the thirst is killing me. It's difficult enough for these people. But brothers and sisters, these are adults. It's easier for them to be able to take the heat and the thirst. In the camps of Imam al Hussein, the young children, Sukaina and the other little girls, they're wanting water I don't know how true this is But some have said they were so thirsty And may be shy to go to their father and uncle And ask for water That they would go under the shade of the tent Roll up their shirts Put their bellies on the sand That had cooled off a bit because of the shade To get a little bit of the Cool of it, but they couldn't stand it any longer. Imagine the scene that Sukaina and the others come to their father and say, Oh, father, we need water. Sallallahu <laughs> alayhi all I can say, brothers and sisters, is that the effort to try to get water at that time failed. 
the children saw Abal Fadl al Abbas going out for water. But later on their father came, maybe looking down, children thinking to themselves what happened to our uncle Abbas, he had promised us water, our uncle never broke his promise. Sallallahu what happened that the Imam came to the tents like that? All I can say is that he heard the call. Ya akha adrak akha. Imam al Hussein arrived over the body of Abu al Fadl al Abbas. This warrior of Karbala. What have they done to you, my beloved brother? You were Qamaru Bani Hashim. What did they do to your face? When you fell down from the horse without hands to protect your face. The arrows they shot at you, one of them apparently was in his eye. اسمك العظيم الأعظم الزهراء وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها بك يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim Ya Muqallib Al-Qulub Thabit Qulubana Ala Deenik Ala Mahabbat Awliyaik Oh Allah, we ask you to hasten the return of our Imam we ask you to help us become true companions of our beloved Imam. Those who will do everything and give everything and give their lives to protect and move his cause forward. Ya Allah, protect and prolong the life of all those helping the cause of Islam, especially the Maraja, Ayatollah Sistani, and especially and especially our beloved leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. O oh Allah, we ask you to forgive us all of our sins. O oh Allah, we ask you to forgive our parents, our grandparents, our relatives, all believers, those who are alive, those who passed away. Ya Allah, we have hajat, we have needs, we have requests. We have ill amongst us, relatives, those who are present here. Other believers we may know or we may not know, we ask you. By the right of Babul Hawa'ij Abu al Fadl al Abbas, that you grant all believers their wishes, their requests, their hajat, cure all their ill, insha'Allah. Ya Allah, we complain to you the difficulties the believers in our communities are facing, especially in Iraq, with the savage enemies that are facing them. Ya Allah, by the right of the warrior of Karbala, Abu al Fadl al Abbas, completely eradicate this enemy from Iraq, from the Muslim Ummah, insha'Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you by the right of the Imam of our time that you relieve all the people of the world of the oppressions they're facing. Bin Nabi wa Alih. Rahimallah, man qara al Fatiha ma'as salawat.